I, I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, the UK economic outlook, but um, as, as you've just heard, uh, Kofas asked me to, to look back on the, uh, the changing nature of the, uh, of the UK economy, and I suppose, you know, in some ways we've been uh, in an age of some instability in the, uh, in the UK for, um, uh, for quite some time, but not, not nearly as much as now. Uh, and I, I've called my talk in an age of instability uh, because we are in this uh, uncertain, volatile time, but also because the, the age of instability is, uh, is uh, the title of a recent book of mine. And uh, I can say it, it, it's a great pleasure to be in the British Library because it's the one place I know there's going to be a copy of that book, you know. And, um, you know, mo most, uh, most bookstores, uh, you, you, I'm not so lucky. But um, anyway, uh, let, me, uh, let me start by looking back and then, uh, and then, uh, and then look forward. And um, I was very interested to do this because I, I'm, a, I'm a great student of the uh, of the uh, of, of post-war UK economic history and the Thatcher era and so on. And I think it is genuinely quite interesting. So you know, two conservative prime ministers, of course, the second one, the current one, in a coalition, but uh, Margaret Thatcher. 1979 to 1990. Uh, Lady Thatcher, of course, has just recently uh, passed away uh, through to David Cameron, uh, the current prime minister. What's changed in the, uh, in the UK economy over, over that period? Well, structurally, quite a lot has changed, and I suppose this is the most striking example of that change. I mean, some of it which, which predates Margaret Thatcher's period in office. I think when people look at the uh, relative decline of manufacturing and, you know, manufacturing going from 30% of GDP, uh, you know, four decades ago to something just over 10% now. I think people tend to think that it's, it's all about manufacturing declining, financial services growing. And, of course, there is something of that. And, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the lines do almost intersect there between manufacturing and financial services. Um, but the much bigger growth, and I suppose the, you know, what has become the dominant sector of the, uh, of the economy in many ways is business services. So we're talking about accountancy, law, uh, consultancy, you know, all those things that come under the, uh, the general heading of, uh, of business services. And that's been the, the biggest growth area for, for the UK economy in, uh, in recent times as manufacturing has suffered this, uh, this relative uh, decline. Uh, when uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, took over, of course, we were still a very high inflation economy, uh, higher inflation economy than most others. And uh, inflation came down very sharply in the, uh, in the early 1980s. And then, you know, much to her um, regret, rose again in the, uh, the, towards the end of her period in, in office. But I think the, the changes that were, were brought in in terms of uh, economic policy and some of the changes I'll come on to in a moment did pave the way for a period, a long period, in which inflation has been more or less under control. So you can, you can distinguish between the, you know, the very high inflation era of the 70s and early 80s, a little upward blip in inflation towards the end of the 80s, but then, for the most part, the UK has been a relatively low inflation economy. And I think that uh, you know, some of the reforms of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the 1980s had a lot to do with that. Uh, most notably, the, uh, the decline in union membership. Now, the decline in union membership occurred for, for two reasons. One is the, uh, those changes in the structure of the economy I was referring to. So within manufacturing, unions tended to be very important, a heavily unionized sector. Uh, when you replace manufacturing with, with services, services, particularly private sector services, tend to be uh, much less unionized, and that is the case now. And we do have a real uh, distinction in the UK economy between public and private sectors at the moment. Union membership is, is very rare in the private sector now. Something like 15% of private sector workers belong to a trade union, compared with around 60% of, uh, of public sector workers. So that is where the, the union strength is is confined really to the uh, to the private sector now. So this had a lot to do with the reforms of the uh, of the 1980s, that, which reduced the, the powers of the trade unions, reduced their ability, if you like, to uh, to disrupt. And associated with that, you know, Britain was the sick man of Europe in the 1970s, very uh, very strike prone, uh, very prone to disruption by industrial disputes. And that has not really been a factor for the last uh, 20 years or so, that, the, uh, you know, that that particular shortcoming of the UK economy really went away thanks to the, uh, thanks to the reforms of the 1980s. So that has been, has been very positive. Um, not all the changes that we've seen uh, you know, and, and the changes over that period were necessarily positive. 
Uh, one of them was the, uh, the greater inequality that came in. Now, some people would say that greater inequality is inevitable when you've got a, a globalized economy. A globalized economy, I think, tends to squeeze the uh, wages of people at the lower end because they're competing with low-cost labor from countries like China. Uh, but it also increases the possibilities for people at the top. When, you, when you've got a global market for executives and so on, that uh, tends to push, push earnings up at the top end, squeezing them at the lower end. But some of it in, uh, inevitably was due to the, the nature of uh, the changing economy in the uh, in 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 the 1980s and beyond. So manufacturing tends to have a rather more uh, limited uh, wage variability. You know the, the gap between uh, the shop floor worker and the uh, um, the factory floor worker and the ex and the chief executive tends to be much smaller than in business and financial services. So that that creates you know some of these inequalities as well. So Britain did become a more unequal country. And although things have stabilized somewhat since then, it's, uh, you know, relatively speaking, uh, inequality is quite high in the, uh, in the UK. Uh, the real, I think the real issue and the re one of the real weaknesses of, uh, of the UK economy is on the, on the trade side. Um, it so happened that, the, you know, the last time, you know, Britain traditionally had a, a trade surplus in, uh, in manufacturing. You go back through history, you know, Birmingham was the workshop of the world. Britain, was, Britain provided uh, you know, manufactured exports to the rest of the world, particularly the old empire and so on. That all changed uh, you know, about 30 years ago. The last time Britain had a manufacturing trade surplus was in 1982. And as you can see here, since then, most of the time, we've had a current account deficit. So the, the broad picture for uh, Britain's trade is that we have quite a large tr uh, trade deficit on goods quite a large, a large trade surplus on services, including business services and finance, but overall uh, a, a current account deficit. And that current account deficit, uh, interestingly, I mean, you would expect the last time we were close to having a surplus was in 1997. Since then, it's been pretty much in deficit. And you would expect in a, a period of recession or, or low growth, particularly if you've had a big fall in the exchange rate, that the current account would have improved. There is not a lot of evidence of that at the moment. So the, the current account deficit you know, looks to be, um, uh, to be fairly chronic. I had expected that the combination of um, devaluation and uh, constrained demand uh, here in the UK would lead to a current account surplus. That hasn't happened. We've, got, we've still got this pretty large deficit. Um, what, you know, interestingly enough, he, you know, Margaret Thatcher, famously Eurosceptic, but, you know, during her period in office, uh, the focus of the UK economy uh, became more on Europe. So she, you know, she was very keen on the, on the single market, completing the single market and so on. So the proportion of UK trade going to the uh, rest of Europe, this just measure, measures the, uh, I think, the original six members of the, uh, of the EU, uh, but you can see the proportion rising quite dramatically over, over time, and, and that's quite interesting. But, uh, of course, it has gone into reverse more recently. So, you know, this is a, a slightly different measure. This is the, the wider EU, so all 27 members of the EU. And we've, we're now in a situation where, roughly speaking, um, just, just under half of exports go to the EU, having been, you know, 60, 65 percent uh, not that long ago. So, you know, and I'll come on to this in a bit more detail when looking at the future in a moment. But uh, there, there is a shift away from, uh, from EU trade happening uh, within, uh, within Britain for all the reasons we, uh, we, we might expect. Um, one of the long-term weaknesses, which was never really corrected. Uh, I mean, you can see, if you look very carefully on this chart, you can see that towards the end of the 1980s, there was a rise in the uh, investment share of GDP. So business investment uh, did increase then, uh, partly as a result of some quite attractive for, for corporate uh, uh, for corporate uh, uh, tax changes, and that was a period where a lot of the inward investment from, particularly from Japan, came in. But overall, the UK has, inten uh, has tended to invest less, both on the infrastructure side and on the business investment side, as a percentage of GDP than, uh, than other countries. And I think most economists would agree that this is one of the longer-term weaknesses of the, uh, of the UK economy, which has never really been corrected. It remains, uh, as again I'll come on to in a moment, uh, an issue uh, as, as, as things stand now. 
Um, the public finances, you know, public finances improved in, the, I mean, you can see, if you, if you just look at that bottom line there, you can see two improvements in the public finances uh, during this period, uh, one of which occurred in the, uh, in the 80s, so we went from quite large deficit to, uh, to small surplus during the 1980s, and the same thing happened in the 1990s, so in the early 1990s recession, Britain had a budget deficit of around 8% of GDP. That turned into a surplus by the end of the 1990s. And I think, you know, the hope was, and maybe it will eventually prove correct, that something similar would happen this time. We, we, you know, we went into the cri you know, as a result of the crisis and perhaps excessive public spending before it. We, went, we had a very large budget deficit, and people hoped that, uh, you know, the, the kind of correction that we saw in the 1990s, where we went from large deficit to surplus in the space of five years, would happen again. And this time it's proving to be a little more difficult. But so, so the public finances did improve. They improved twice in the 1980s and 1990s. Jury's out on whether they are uh, going to improve to the same extent now. Uh, one of the things we, uh, you know, at, at the end of the 80s, um, I, I did a book called North and South, which is about the regional uh, differences within the UK. And you know, even then you could see that we were moving towards a, uh, a, a, an economy, a country dominated by London and the South East. And this was really only on the, at the beginning of the, you know, the great revival of the city following Big Bang and all the other changes, and in particular the rise of London as a, as a global city. In the, in the 70s and the 80s, the, you know, London was often regarded as a city in decline. It was a problem city. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't going anywhere. Population was declining. Population declined in London in the 1970s. The revival of London in the southeast and the fact that it has left, you know, most other parts of the uh, of the of the uh, of, uh, of the UK behind has been one of the features, not just of this period on this chart uh, from 1997 to 2011, but for for quite a long term. I think this did start in the 1980s and. It, it, both, it both speaks to the, you know, the, I think, you know, very creditable performance of, of the London economy and the revival of London, but also of, you know, some serious issues around what's happening in, the, in, the, in other parts of the country. And, you know, as, as we see with Scotland, you know, the question of whether uh, Scotland should become independent, there, there is a referendum going to happen there. So it's, it, it's interesting to see that this is, you know, the, the north-south divide, as we, as we sometimes call it, has certainly increased during this, this period of the last 30 years, and the dominance of London and the southeast has, uh, has increased very, very, very substantially. Um, both the 1980s and the 1990s saw very strong economic growth. I mean, one of the issues we've got at the moment is that in, you know, in, in normal uh, recessions and recoveries, you would expect to see, you know, fairly early on, you know, year two or year three, some GDP growth numbers with a three in front of them, you know, 3%, 3.5%, even more than that. That was the case, as you can see here in the, in the 1980s. It was the case again in the 1990s for, for a long period. And the difference this time is that, uh, you know, we're lucky to get growth numbers with a, with a one in front of them at the moment. So, uh, so there is, you know, there is a big difference there in terms of the history. And uh, this one is almost a sort of, uh, this chart is almost a, a collector's item because um, it was taken from a, uh, a, a, a the, the only chart I could find that went back far enough. Uh, was taken from a budget document, or I think a pre-budget report document, of December 2009. So December 2009 was a, uh, you know, was a period where there was great uncertainty, but there was also, as you can see, if, uh, if you look to the right of that chart, optimism within the Treasury. And these, this is a time when the Treasury was doing the forecast. We hadn't set up the new independent Office of Budget Responsibility, that something similar would happen. You know, despite the scale of the crisis, despite the fact that, uh, you know, budget, uh, the deficit had to be cut, you can see the hope on the right-hand side there in that, uh, in that forecast portion uh, that we'd, be, we'd see something similar, that 3% growth would be achieved again. Uh, and that has proved to be, a, a, you know, a... a uh, a rather, um, a rather faint hope as we've moved on, but uh, but the you know the, the, it, again this is, is the, the normal condition in recoveries is is somewhat faster growth than we've had uh, this time. Now overall, you know, despite all this, some things good, some things bad. I think the striking thing, and this came from a, a recent report from the London School of Economics, their, their Growth Commission. 
the relative performance of the UK economy uh, did improve uh, from around about 1980. Now, was that all uh, Margaret Thatcher, or was it just that uh, you know, we, we went to the brink with the IMF rescue of 1976, something had to improve, and it would have improved uh, under any politician. I suspect she, did, she had quite a lot to do with it, and the reforms that she introduced had quite a lot to do with it. Now, the way to read this, um, this chart is not to say that at the end of the period, uh, in 2011, 2012, the UK had the highest per capita GDP in the world. It didn't. You know, it's, it's clearly below the US, below uh, uh, Germany and France. But what this measures is the growth in that GDP per capita from, and from about 1980. And what it shows is that we were in a long run of relative decline. I mean, 100 years of relative decline from 1870 to 1980 were reversed, uh, this one doesn't go back as far as uh, 1870 unfortunately, but were reversed around about 1980 and suddenly Britain began to do better relatively than our competitor countries. And, uh, and that's quite interesting. It, it, just, it does suggest to me that the, you know, despite all the ups and downs, you know, the inequality, the chronic current account deficit, some, something happened. Uh, inflation was tamed, the industrial relations got better, and other things happened to make the economy more entrepreneurial, uh, more growth friendly, and that resulted in, uh, in quite an improvement. Now, well, some people say, well, wasn't it all North Sea oil? Didn't we have the great benefit of North Sea oil? Well, North Sea oil was an advantage for the UK, but taken over, and that advantage was mainly in the 1980s, taken over this period as a whole, this 30 year period as a whole, North Sea oil neither contributed nor reduced economic growth. So it contributed for a while, and then it be became a drag on economic growth as it, as it is at the moment. So so overall, I think it is, it is mainly what was happening to the onshore economy, and there was a, there was a relative improvement. So, you know, there, there is something to be optimistic about, about the, uh, about the UK economy. What about look at now, where we are now? I mean, that's the, uh, that's the look back. Um, where, we are now, where, where are we now about the, uh, about the UK economy? Um, and I think you can take it one of two ways. Now, you know, some people are not, are not from the UK, but I'd be interested in a view as well. Uh, when people look at the the economy, um, are, do they you know do they just want to put their head in their hands and scream as in this uh, this famous Munch painting, or uh, do people see some some kind of light at the end of the tunnel? Let, let, let's uh, let's perhaps have a show of hands on that. Who's in the uh, who's in the scream? It's it's not it's never going to get better. It's terrible, and I'm I'm not optimistic. Let's have a show of hands for that view. Yeah. There's a few of those. And who sees some sort of light at the end of the tunnel? Ah, uh -huh. well, yeah, my work is done. I'll, uh, I'll uh, <laughs> understand, understand. Yeah, but, yeah. So let, let, me, uh, let me explore uh, some of that and, the, uh, and some, of the, uh, some of the outlook for the, uh, for the UK. I mean, the reason why I think, um, and the reason why you know, the minority uh, you know, could uh, have, have, a, have a point is that th this is not just the UK. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're going to hear about uh, other parts of the world soon. But for all advanced economies, we're in this post-crisis uh, hangover. And I think this is a, this is a neat way of, uh, of describing it. I hope people can, can read that properly at the, uh, the back. But you know, maybe the period before the crisis you could describe as a, a virtuous or, you know, perhaps not so virtuous circle, but, uh, but, you know, whatever was happening there, you know, growth almost seemed too easy, you know, the, so there was, a, the, you know, credit was easily available, employment was growing, the downside risks seemed very limited, so confidence was high, and that gave you a kind of virtuous circle where, where growth seemed to be, all, you know, almost effortless. Um, this time, all those factors have gone into reverse. So, you know, you've got uh, credit is in very, in, in certainly bank lending is in, in short supply because you've got the banking sector deleveraging. You've also got great risk aversion among firms and households, so they are reluctant to, uh, to take on debt. High unemployment, you know, not sky high unemployment, but high unemployment reduces uh, consumer confidence. Austerity reduces economic growth, there's no doubt about that. And the financial sector remains pretty fragile. And the, 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 you know, those things interlink with each other to give you what, uh, what uh, this calls the, the low growth trap for advanced economies. And as I say, it's not just, um, it's not just the UK, this, this compares the where we've been you know, from the recession of 2008-9, in terms of domestic demand, 
throughout the advanced world. So the OECD countries are the advanced economies, and the blue line, the, the, the single blue line there, is the current cycle. And you can see how weak the recovery in domestic demand has been throughout the OECD compared with the two, uh, well, well, compared with the two previous recoveries, where even after a period in which it took time to get going, uh, you can see the difference in the, in the scale and strength of the recovery over those periods. So this is not just a UK demand problem. It's throughout the, uh, throughout the advanced world. What about the UK? I mean, of course, you know, at one time, the loss of the AAA rating was, was, was seen almost as a resignation offence for the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, George Osborne. He seems to have got through that. I mean, we, you know, we almost regard uh, the loss of the AAA now as a, as a, as a non-event, but, uh, but it's happened. Um, you know, the, cons the government came to power uh, with a, you know, not with quite with a mandate to, pr to protect or preserve the AAA, but certainly uh, they said that they would, uh, that, was, that was one of their main aims. It has, we have seen a downgrade by two of the ratings agencies. The difference, I think, and uh, the interesting difference between what's been happening in this recovery, and of course you should take the numbers with a slight pinch of salt because they are prone to revision, but I don't think the big picture will change fundamentally. Compare where we, what, we, what has happened over the past few years. This, these are quarterly GDP changes. So, and, and GDP has become, you know, in a way it never was before, the most important economic indicator. The Office for National Statistics, I, mean, I can remember reporting the GDP figures uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s, and half a dozen of us would go along to the ONS for a, uh, for a private briefing with the statistician, and, uh, and we might, it might or might not get into the paper. Uh, these days, they have a televised press conference with 60 journalists there, and it's, it's the, the hottest news in economics at the moment. But, uh, so, and, and you know, maybe, maybe that's good. I mean, it's good that people are interested. But compare the, the period before the, uh, before the crisis. So uh, the long run of, uh, of those quarterly GDP changes, all of which were positive, even the one that looks like it's zero was, was, was marginally positive. And uh, so you have from the autumn of 1991, to the early part of 2008, a, an unstoppable period of economic growth. 66 consecutive quarters of economic growth. Each one, each GDP change was positive, each one was up. There has never been anything like that before. Uh, the previous record was 19. Uh, there will never be anything like that again. So if people have got a vague memory of that period, uh, store it away, you know, because you, you know, they, they will, it will not happen again. And contrast it with the, the period since the economy turned in the middle of 2009, uh, when we've had 15 GDP readings and five of them have been negative. So, you know, you can contrast an unbroken period of economic growth, which lasted for 16 years, 66 quarters, with the more stuttering performance of, uh, of recent years. And there's no doubt that, you know, that as with other OECD countries, this has been uh, disappointing. The reasons for that, I mean, the, the fiscal consolidation, the tax increases and spending cuts are part of it, but I think they're only a, a relatively small part of it. The other factors, which, you know, some of which are unfortunate, uh, but some of which you might, you might, you know, logically have expected, very weak credit growth. You know, credit is the oxygen of a modern economy. If you cut it off, you're going you're gonna to struggle to grow. Uh, high, the high inflation squeeze on real incomes, as I say, inflation has been relatively low, uh, for a long time now, but the fact that it's been slightly higher uh, during this recent period has been really problematical. We're going to hear about the Eurozone, that's what I'm talking about mainly uh, in terms of weakness in main export markets, but other advanced economy markets are also quite weak. That's been a problem. That may be why the devaluation of sterling didn't feed through to stronger export performance, and this household and corporate sector deleveraging uh, that I, I referred to on the earlier charts. So just explore some of those in a little bit more detail. In terms of uh, bank lending, and of course enormous political efforts are, are being put into to getting more lending going into the economy, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the replacement, the, the, the yesterday's uh, you know, surprise announcement that Stephen Hester is, uh, is being asked to leave RBS. You know, part of that was to do with the government's desire to, to, for RBS to be, as they put it, supporting the economy more, which means lending more. I mean, they, 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 they perhaps feel, and I don't know whether this is fair or not, that Stephen Hester was mainly concerned with returning the bank to financial health rather than getting it lending more. So that, you know, that, that was interesting. But essentially, we've moved from a situation where, uh, you know, credit growth, lending growth was 10 to 15% a year and was on tap 
to a situation where we've had you know, virtually zero credit growth for the last four or five years and falling uh, bank lending to, uh, to smaller firms. The, this high inflation squeeze on real incomes, as I say, this is, you know, this is the traditional, we're, you know, we're in a literary place here and there's a Dickens room around the corner. You know, if you, Dickens' Mr. Micawber would know what this was all about. You know. if, your, if inflation is going up more than your earnings, that is a recipe for misery, you know, and, that, and uh, there is no doubt about that. And that has been the case for the last few years. I mean, various reports have come out this week on the fall in real wages that we've had recently. So, and the, you know, it, it's happened on both sides. It, I mean, it was terribly unfortunate that this, this, you know, this wonderful record that the Bank of England had in, in controlling inflation, they suddenly lost it just about the time when the crisis was building up and starting. So for most of the past six or seven years, inflation has been above the 2% target and sometimes you know, quite considerably above it. So it's touched 5% on a couple of occasions. At a time when earnings growth has been extremely weak, you know, earnings growth has been around about the 1% or 2% level. Now, normally, and maybe this goes back to that decline in the power of unions, you know, uh, where, but normally, you know, throughout modern economic history, if inflation was 2%, earnings growth would be 4%. If inflation was 3%, earnings growth would be 5%. The, you know, the, there were, the, normally, something happened, whether it was union negotiations or what, to give you a situation where earnings always outstripped inflation. You always had some growth in real wages. You see that in the picture before uh, the crisis. Now, and this may be temporary, it may, may, may signal something more permanent, that has not been the case. It's, uh, we've had this fall in, uh, in real earnings. And you can see that is unusual. You know, the bottom line there is the, uh, is the recent period. Most of the time, even after the previous recessions, the recessions of the 1980s, recession of the 1990s, you've got uh, real wages start to recover quite quickly. And that's very important in terms of generating uh, growth in consumer spending. Now, some, some people say, well, we don't want growth in consumer spending. You know, consumer spending is, is the old unbalanced economy. You know, the new uh, rebalanced economy should be dependent on exports and investment. And you, know, and you would hope that as part of the rebalancing, those two do play a bigger part. But consumer spending is, is two-thirds of GDP. You can't have a recovery in GDP, or a meaningful recovery in GDP, without a rise in consumer spending of, uh, you know, of, some, of some weight. And, so, and that is, again, the difference that we've got there. And I think it's, it is the, it's two things that are happening here. One is the squeeze on real wages, which I think is the most important. The other is that uh, households have become uh, more debt-averse. They've been more concerned with running down debt than, uh, than borrowing. And so the result of that is that this is the weakest consumer recovery we've, uh, we've seen in, mo in modern times. Consumer spending uh, is still around about 2 or 3% below where it was before the crisis. And so, and, and, you know, you think about that, it's not just the fact that it's yet to regain the level it was before the crisis, but if you're in, the, if you're in a consumer-facing business, you've missed out on all the growth that would have occurred in those years as well. You know, so from 2000, the, the, the peak was 2008, early 2008. We're still below that. And you know, most consumer businesses would have expected something like 2% real growth in consumer spending per year over that period. So this is a big change. And the weakness of the consumer it tells us a lot about the weakness of the, uh, of the UK economy. We've had a um, fiscal tightening, of course. Now, a big debate about, you know, the fiscal tightening, is it too much, is it too, uh, you know, should it have happened at all? I think there's no doubt it should have happened, you know, that if you've got a budget deficit of 11% of GDP, a sharply rising debt, you're on the brink of a fiscal crisis, as I think the UK was in May 2010. You have to do something about it. There's a little bit of debate, I think, about whether it, so much of it should, be, should have been done in terms of cutting infrastructure spending, which tends to have the biggest impact on, on economic growth. And a lot of the reduction in, in, in overall public spending has been on the infrastructure side, which I think was, was probably not a good idea. But something had to be done about this. And I, I repeat that there is nothing that exceptional about, you know, if you listen to the IMF and people like that, you would think that this was some mad experiment being, consult, uh, being uh, conducted by you know, David Cameron and George Osborne, uh, which is not happening anywhere else. You know, the, the UK fiscal tightening is roughly in the middle of what is happening elsewhere in the world. I mean, it's quite similar to what is happening in the US. I mean, people tend to say, well, you know, 
we need a stimulus, we need, you know, we need to expand uh, you know, government spending, reduce taxes as they're doing in the US. The US has a fiscal tightening. You know, the, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, there, is, there, there is no distinction there. You, know, it's, it's, you look at the OECD figures, it's, it's, you know, and the US budget deficit uh, is, in, and, and some of this is involuntary in the US, and as you Robin will, will talk about. But, um, but I think it's a false dichotomy to say that you know, the, U, the UK is somehow you know, way over there on, the, uh, on, on some extreme in terms of the fiscal tightening. However, it is proving, you know, and, and the other reason why something had to be done, if you don't tackle, and the, this, is a, this is a chart from the IFS, if you don't tackle these things, if you run 11% budget deficits forever, then you're going to have a real problem on your hands in terms of the unsustainability of debt. Now, you know, I'm not saying that the UK would have got to 250% of GDP in terms of its, uh, its public sector debt, but we know, we have an example of a country which, which has that, and, and you know, Japan is very close to that, and getting on for half of Japanese tax revenues go to servicing the debt, and you, you, know, you just don't want to get into that situation where you're squeezing public services just to, just to service the debt. So I think it had to be done. The real problem in all this, and it, you know, it refers back to what I was saying a moment ago about the growth you could have expected in consumer spending if the recession and crisis hadn't happened. It's the same for the economy as a whole. This, uh, you know, the, in terms of what might have been expected, you know, so, say we'd have had, you know, we'd had a recession and normal recovery, then you'd get back onto the trend line, the normal you know, path for GDP relatively quickly, and over time, you'd forget about that recession, you'd forget about the lost GDP. This time, it seems to be permanent. Roughly speaking, you know, the economy seems to be, the UK economy seems to be about 12, 13% smaller than it was before, the, or we might have expected it to be before the crisis, and that looks to be an enduring effect, you know. So, you, and you need much stronger economic growth than we've had to start to, to, to think you can close that gap. So, and that, that creates all sorts of problems for the public finances. It creates challenges for business because, you know, demand and growth and the level of GDP, the level of economic activity is much weaker than you might have expected. Uh, the fiscal tightening, uh, you know, the, the real, I suppose the real disappointment with the fiscal tightening is it's taking so long and it's going to take, you know, someone recently was saying, well, you know, we're going to have an austerity election in 2015 and it's quite likely we'll have another one in 2020. You know, the, the austerity, it, it, the coalition government hoped it would all be over by 2015. They will be able to say, you know, we've done two things. We've sold RBS and Lloyds back. To the, uh, to the private sector, and we've also sorted out the deficit that we inherited. It's clear it's taking longer than that. It will take into the next parliament. And I think that, well, that becomes, you get a, 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 you know, uh, a strong element of austerity fatigue when that happens. However, you know, so that is, that, you know, austerity is going to be a, a drag on the UK economy for some time. Uh, but other things, I think, are a little bit more positive. I mean, one, one is that uh, I've, I've talked about the debt aversion, the credit aversion. On the consumer side, and this may have to do with you know, the various schemes that are in place, such as funding for lending, but consumer credit is certainly starting to pick up again. So that is to do, you know, that is both, uh, you know, the, on the mortgage side it's happening, but also on the you know, traditional consumer credit. And that is a sign, perhaps, of greater, slightly greater confidence among consumers. We've had this big fall in the household debt burden. You know, this does not normally happen. You know, household debt normally rises as a uh, percentage of GDP, stays there for a bit if there's a recession and then goes, starts to go up again. This time, as you can see, it's come down from what admittedly was a very high level to a somewhat lower level. And that reflects, you know, essentially, it's, it's not necessarily every household in the country going and repaying its debt. But, you know, you think of the, the you know, what's happened over the past few years. Normally, the normal condition of household debt is, is for it to rise. You know, most household debt in the UK, around 90% of it is mortgage debt. The, the way the housing market works is that people leave it at one end, you know, older people leave it either voluntarily or, or involuntarily uh, without any debt. Uh, younger people enter it and they have to take on debt. They, they need a mortgage to enter the housing market. So, you know, the normal condition is that debt rises over time. This time, because you know, mortgage availability has been very low, we've seen debt come down. And, so, and I, I think there has been, so that's quite a big adjustment from, uh, from households. Industry, I think, 
you know, we expected, and for a while it seemed as though the manufacturing industry was going to do a very, you know, a great deal better than the rest of the economy. It did well in 2010, early part of 2011. I think the Eurozone crisis, the intensification of the Eurozone crisis hurt uh, manufacturing quite a lot. But there are signs more recently that manufacturing is, uh, is starting to pick up. So I think there is, there is better news there. Um, and it may be, the, you know, one, one of the great pressures that have resulted in uh, inflation has been the rise in commodity prices, global commodity prices, the rise in energy prices, combined with a lower pound. You know, those, those, those two ingredients might have given you, you know, much higher inflation than we've had in recent years. Uh, but, you know, inflation has been, as I say, uncomfortably high relative to earnings. It may be that this is starting to ease back a bit. You know, the great, uh, you know, the great surge in global commodity prices seems to have come to, the, uh, come to an end. Some of the commodity investors now talk about this super cycle that they previously talk about, talked about coming to an end. So there's a little bit of hope there that that, uh, that squeeze on earnings may be easing. And this is, the, uh, this is what the Bank of England expects to happen. This is one of the Bank of England's famous fan charts. And uh, I may have said this last time, but I'll repeat it again. I always say this is a great way of doing economic forecasting because you can never be entirely wrong, you know. But, the, uh, um, but you can see that, uh, you know, the, the, in, the, in the middle there, they, expect to, they do expect inflation to come down at least to the 2% the target over the, over the coming years. Uh, I will say they've said this before, and it hasn't proved to be right, but uh, that maybe there's just a little bit more, uh, more uh, evidence there. And, and inflation at the moment, you know, the latest reading was 2.4%, which is, which is closer to the, uh, to the target than, uh, than many people expected. Um, and it may be we've got a new governor of the Bank of England taking over relatively soon. People had expected one of the first things you would have to do was write a letter explaining why inflation was too high. There's an open letter system here. Uh, it may be that he escapes that embarrassment, you know, so, uh, so that will be quite interesting. And the other projection, again, this is one of these fan charts, is that growth will gradually pick up. And I, I think this is reasonable. You know, I think it's reasonable to say that will happen. Again, you know, you will see if you look at the solid green bit there, there are, there are no 3% there. But, uh, you know, getting up towards something which maybe has a, uh, has a 2 in front of it. And the recent evidence, I should say, has been, uh, has been better. You know, it was an enormous relief and very important. And um, people said, well, you know, 0.3% growth is neither here nor there. But it was incredibly important that we had growth in the first quarter, and we didn't have, you know, what, what, uh, what people were ready to call a triple dip, uh, because that would have unleashed, you know, an enormous amount of criticism on, on the government, on the Bank of England, and everybody else. The IMF was about to visit when that, uh, that figure was released. They would have said, this needs a change in direction. I think things would have been, become very uncertain if we hadn't had that positive growth. It looks as though we'll get a better figure in the second quarter, and you hope that things uh, you know, continue to improve beyond that. But I'm not, I'm not pretending that things are, you know, are, are rosy yet. You know, business investment, a long-term problem for the UK economy, still too weak. Uh, we need to see that pick up more. We're going to get some new figures on business investment in, uh, in a couple of weeks' time, which may change that picture somewhat. But overall, the expected sharp recovery in business investment hasn't happened. Exports, I mean, you see the difference there between <clears throat> what has been quite a good performance in terms of exports to um, the rest of the world, to the non-EU parts of the world, <clears throat> alongside quite a poor performance for all the reasons we know about in exports to the, uh, to the EU. And, and on balance, you know, that means that uh, the, the, tr the truth is somewhere in the middle and it's not yet been, uh, been strong enough. So we need more, that, more to happen from that. What are, the, uh, what are the challenges looking forward for the UK economy? We've talked about some of the history. Uh, I think they, th there are many, but I'll just, just concentrate on four of them very briefly and I, then I hope we'll have time for a couple of questions. The first one is uh, energy, you know, conflicting messages there. The second one is the great rebalancing, you know, will the economy rebalance? Manufacturing, is it going to be more important in the future? And I suppose very important to this audience and many others, will we stay in the EU? On energy, there are, you know, there's a conflicting story there. I mean, on the, on the one hand, you have the fact that uh, generation capacity, the replacement of the nuclear stations, uh, is an issue, and it's an issue over the next few years. You know, we came close to uh, gas shortages over the, the winter just gone. 
Uh, the Ofgem, the regulator, has warned of the increasing danger of power cuts, particularly around about 2015-16, when some of the existing power stations go out of use. And some, and nuclear is not proving to be uh, as attractive to, uh, to investors, the private sector, as was hoped. So I think those, you know, that, that is, is an area which still has to be resolved, and I think the government has, has not uh, been, been great in resolving that. So, so the issue of power generation capacity is still a serious one. However, you know, a couple of positive things that are happening. North Sea oil has been quite weak in the, in the last few years. Uh, it seems inevitable, given the scale of the investment going in, that for, for the next few years, we will see a revival in North Sea oil output. You know, it's, it's, it's a... It's a sector, it's, a, it's a, an oil province which is in long-term decline, but for the next few years, it will start to make a positive contribution to growth. North Sea oil production will, will go up and gas production. And then we've got shale. You know, what is the potential of shale? Lots of reports saying that shale could be extremely important to the UK. Uh, huge issues over how it can be exploited, whether it can be exploited in an environmentally acceptable way. But I think this could be you know, a, a significant story in the, in the coming years. But I, I, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to bet the economy on it because we don't yet know. But that could, be, that could be quite positive. I don't think it'll be as positive as it has been for the US, but I think it could be positive. Tilting towards the east. Now, we're seeing this happening, as I, I think I showed with one of the charts. And I think that will increase. I mean, in some ways, though, it's, it is still quite disappointing, the performance of UK exporters in, in some of these markets. You go to many of these countries, and you can just see that uh, you know, German exporters, French exporters in many cases, Japanese exporters, uh, really got there sooner and have, have established the infrastructure for, invest, uh, for exporting, uh, while you know, many UK businesses are, are still are still in the, in, the, in the relatively early phase of that. But, we, but there is good growth in some of those sectors. So it's, you know, as I think, I think there, is, there is promise there. Manufacturing, you know, in some ways, you know, do, can you ever go from a long-term decline in manufacturing share of the GDP to an increase? That is quite rare. It doesn't normally happen. I think there are, some, some things are happening there. There is some return of manufacturing in, into the UK, and some parts of it are starting to do quite well. The strong pound period, 1996 to 2007, was damaging, but I'm quite optimistic about manufacturing, particularly high-value manufacturing in the UK. I think it will, will do better. And finally, will Britain stay in the EU? We, we, we obviously have seen a, an increase in expressed Euroscepticism. You see that in the polls and so on. And you've even had, I think, which is quite unusual, very senior politicians saying that if there was a referendum tomorrow, they would vote to, uh, to leave the EU. There's two things I would say about the, this whole debate, though. The first is that, you know, the conditions to have a referendum are quite challenging politically. It requires a conservative majority at the next general election, which I think even conservatives would say is, uh, you know, is, is, is quite a, uh, is quite a, a demanding uh, uh, thing to expect. And also, uh, and when it, if it did happen, I, think, I don't think the Euroscepticism goes, as, goes quite as deeply. People in the audience may disagree, goes quite as deeply as it seems. I would expect that it, when it came to it, we had a referendum before in 1975 when at the start of that campaign there was net scepticism and, uh, you know, and people seemed to want to withdraw from the EU uh, or the common market in those days. I think something like that would happen again. I, th I, I do believe that if there was a referendum, uh, overall the British people would vote something like 60-40 to, to stay in. I don't think we would vote for withdrawal. But that is a long way down the, ro the road. And I, I, do, I do accept that this creates some uncertainty. So just summing up briefly, and I, I'm probably taking too much time, we've seen um, fundamental changes in the UK economy. Now we're struggling to break out of it. something rather different, this big challenge, maybe once in a hundred year challenge. And, you know, normal recovery is not there yet. But there, are, there is the start of something which suggests, I think, a slightly better picture. All the things that are holding growth back, I think, slowly are, being, uh, are starting to be fixed. You know, so, as, and even the Eurozone is not quite as, I mean, we may have a different view in a moment but in, uh, after the break, but um, it's not quite as bad as it might have been. You know, uh, the, the Eurozone no longer looks as though it's, it's about to collapse. Interest rates are going to stay low. Uh, I think 0.5% you know, bank rate is with us 
until at least uh, in 2016. I think this low, very low interest era is going to last for, uh, for, for quite some time. And uh, just finally, and again, I uh, apologize if I said this last time, but when I, whenever I am uncertain about, the, uh, about the, uh, the, the economy and the economic indicators, which can be very contradictory and are uh, subject to revision, I do return to my, uh, my skip index, my proprietary economic indicator, which is never revised. You know, this one, uh, this one is, is, always, uh, is always as it is. And this is based simply on the number of builders' skips in my street. Uh, if there are, if I can get technical for a moment, if there are none at all, we're in recession. If there are two, we're in line with what economists would call trend growth. And if there are four, it's an unsustainable boom. And uh, uh, I can tell you at the moment, we've got, uh, we've got two skips in the street. So, uh, so I'm quite encouraged by that. Thank you very much. Thank you.